Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Frankie Manning Foundation and myself, I'd like to thank you for joining us. It's a real thrill and an honor for me to present this virtual seminar, especially for this wonderful organization. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to this work. I became a Lindy Hop dancer in 2003 while I was attending Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. And about two months into my learning this dance, Frankie Manning came to Greensboro to give a workshop and he also showed old films and he told us stories about the Savoy Ballroom. And as is a common story for a number of dancers, that was when I truly caught the bug and I have been hooked um, ever since. I ended up going to graduate school for musicology at the University of North Carolina. And owing to my deep love of swing music and dance, I did my doctoral dissertation on the Chick Webb Orchestra because I really wanted to dig into the depth of their connection with Lindy Hop dancers. And I did this research digging through the numerous mentions of the band in African-American newspapers from the 1920s and 1930s, which very fortunately at the time I was doing the research were quite, were increasingly available digitally in text searchable databases. So I was really able to find quite a lot of information. I also became so fascinated with the band's numerous forms of dynamic engagement with Harlem as a community, and especially with the way they managed not only to survive the economic onslaught of the Great Depression, but really to thrive and lay the foundation in the early 1930s for a tremendous amount of success uh, throughout the decade, both locally and nationally before Webb's tragic passing in 1939. And when Mandy Gould and I were discussing me giving some kind of virtual talk for the foundation, this topic seemed very timely and very important. When I teach music history, it's not just about celebrating the great music and musicians who produced it, but I teach in a music school, so it's also about helping working artists build a playbook of strategies for dealing with a range of different circumstances and challenges that may come up throughout their careers, taking inspiration from the centuries of artists who've come before them and navigated all kinds of world-altering crises. So that's where the idea emerges for my talk today. As so many in our community, and especially full-time dancers and full-time musicians, have really been rocked and just devastated by this pandemic. Uh, before I get started, a couple things I want to note to set some expectations for the talk. Uh, the first is that, and this is a bit unusual for a music history talk, I'm not going to be play any, playing any musical recordings during the talk itself. And that's because the focus is more on the venues in which the Chick Webb Band performed and the socioeconomic circumstances surrounding those performances. But also more importantly, because doing this kind of online talk is new territory for me and for the foundation. And the last thing I would want to do is run afoul of some algorithm and, and uh, get it taken down or muted or something like that. So what I'll do instead is I'll link to a playlist of Chick Webb recordings that I think pair well with the themes and various moments in the talk so that you can all listen to those recordings on your own time. Second thing is that um, rather than speaking off the cuff, I'm going to be reading from a script. If you haven't noticed already, I am reading from a script right now. And I'm doing that way for a couple of reasons. Reason A is that it's kind of standard practice in my field of musicology to give talks in this way for better or worse, and especially without a live audience to interact with, it'll just kind of put me in my comfort zone, which is where we all need to be right now. And reason B, the far more important reason, is that I know we have a global audience and many people for whom English is a second language who are tuning in, as well as possibly others with different kinds of challenges or needs surrounding, flip the page, <laughs> hearing and auditory processing. So I want to be able to give the foundation an accurate transcript to post along with the talk so that anyone who wants or needs can follow along with written text. Or if anyone wants to translate for their home community, it might be helpful to have that as well. So I'll add the transcript. I'll, I'll, also, I'll also add that the transcript I prepared is largely adapted from a chapter of my PhD dissertation, which is freely publicly available. So I will post a link to that as well for anyone who's interested in reading the more expansive research from which I've put this talk together. And after the talk itself, which I'm recording ahead of time to mitigate any potential internet connectivity issues on my end, um, I will be available live for some Q&A, which I am really looking forward to. So let's dive right in. So my presentation today is titled, Thriving in Crisis, the Chick Webb Orchestra and the Great Depression. 
Chickweb was born and raised in Baltimore and moved to Harlem in the mid 1920s. And it was in Harlem that the virtuoso drummer would emerge as one of the most significant band leaders of the swing era and as the band leader most closely associated with Harlem as a community and most notably for the global Lindy Hop community with the Savoy Ballroom. After moving to Harlem, Webb quickly made his mark and his bands rapidly developed a reputation as among Harlem's finest. In 1929, however, the marketplace for musicians in Harlem, as was true both across the United States and globally, was abruptly and dramatically altered by a stock market crash that triggered the Great Depression, arguably the 20th century's most significant economic crisis. While many musicians began to feel the pinch, Webb expressed significant confidence publicly during the early, early years of the Great Depression. He was one of several band leaders interviewed by the Chicago Defender in late 1931, as worsening conditions impacted Black people in all professions. Webb's response highlighted his band's attitude of perseverance. The young musical hounds who constitute the chicks are not at all frightened by the tenseness of the situation, especially in the orchestral field. And we are confident in our ability to weather the storm with perfect ease. That is a characteristic of ours. And we are by no means intending to be different now. We will blow our way to the top. While Webb's boasting might have been more about publicity than substance, and of course we can't confirm whether Webb actually said this, or whether it came from a manager or publicist, as was common practice at the time. His confidence turned out to be prophetic. Webb's popularity and his financial success did steadily increase throughout the 1930s, and his band worked regularly at Harlem's theaters and ballrooms, recorded prolifically for the DECA label, and was among the first African-American dance bands with significant national radio exposure. He managed to achieve success during an economic crisis by skillfully adapting to shifting demands and conditions as the Great Depression's specific impacts on Harlem restructured the institutional dynamics of public performance. By adapting to changing policies and politics, engaging new patronage systems, working within new labor structures and seizing new performance opportunities, Webb and his band managed to thrive during the Depression. Their coverage and reception in the Black press during this time highlights the band's capability to adapt nimbly and respond creatively to its changing circumstances by immersing themselves even more thoroughly into the social life of Harlem's community. But to set the stage for this story, let's back up to the 1920s with a topic that honestly I thought before the coronavirus pandemic hit was going to be more of a central focus for me when giving talks this year. Um, and that topic is how our image of the, of the so-called roaring 20s of economic prosperity and freewheeling prohibition era revelry actually obscures the lived experiences of most African Americans who were struggling tremendously. During the 1920s, Harlem became the largest African American community in the United States. The neighborhood's black population mushroomed from 20,000 to over 200,000 over the course of that decade. By 1930, Harlem housed 80% of Manhattan's black population. Harlem's emergence as the United States' largest and most condensed African-American community resulted from a mass immigration of African-American immigrants from the rural South and of African diasporic immigrants from the Caribbean and West Indies, among other places, to Northern cities like New York what's come to be known as the Great Migration. And that was coupled with a number of formal and informal segregation practices that consolidated and contained those populations in specific neighborhoods. If you study the history of New York City's African-American population, you'll see that they were gradually pushed farther and farther uptown in Manhattan as uh, segregation continued to kind of expand the border upwards um, for where they, they were able to, to find housing. While Black people moved to Harlem seeking opportunity and a chance to participate in the thriving industrial culture of metropolitan New York City, they faced severely limited economic and vocational opportunities due to the harsh impacts of segregation. Most Harlem residents lived in overcrowded, substandard housing units, and those with jobs experienced very little job security and even less opportunity for advancement, and this is during the ostensibly prosperous 1920s. 
As Cheryl Greenberg puts it in her very important study of Harlem or Does It Explode, quote, Harlem crumbled into a slum while optimists noticed only advancement. It lived in depression before the depression. She argues that African Americans were, in economic terms, not only a race, but also a largely homogeneous economic class at the bottom rung of New York City's economic ladder. Quote, Blacks fared worse than other groups in the labor force. Opportunities for advancement were few and earnings low. Both employers and unions continued to maintain racial barriers to mobility. In Harlem's nightlife and entertainment industry, this meant having to navig navigate intense pressures to accommodate the exploitation of African-American culture by so-called white slummers, who effectively wanted to enjoy all the fun and exciting parts of Harlem's nightlife and take little to no responsibility for the ways they benefited um, from the white supremacist system that yielded the conditions in which the residents who created and maintained that nightlife lived at the time. Moving from Baltimore to Harlem in the mid-1920s, this is the environment uh, that Webb found himself having to navigate. As performance historian James F. Wilson described the white slumming phenomenon, quote, Harlem was perceived and advertised as a site that tempted visitors with possibilities of both social and sexual transgressions, and it promised a, quote, pornographic playground where adventurous socialites could publicly enact their private fantasies. White patrons enacted these fantasies within the segregated performance spaces that lined Harlem's main commercial thoroughfare in a series of nightclubs dubbed Jungle Alley, for their emphasis on racist stereotypes of black people as more primitive and animalistic than whites. In these spaces, black patrons were turned away by black bouncers to keep clear the distinction between white consumers and black service workers. As tap dancer James Berry recalled in an interview with Mira Den, segregated clubs were vigorously guarded to make sure that wealthy whites from downtown experienced the thrill of apparent danger while receiving protection that kept them extremely safe. White visitors even booked local tour guides to give themselves a taste of ostensibly authentic Harlem culture while still maintaining the distance between the consuming patron and the objects of their racialized fantasy. Barry recalls this dynamic claiming that, quote, doormen, chauffeurs, guides used to get rich taking people around, mostly people from Europe. They were shown the spots and they came back all the time because they enjoyed themselves. As an economic force, this pornographic playground image and the industry it's, it supported traded upon harmful stereotypes, though it also infused money into the neighborhood, leveraging this desire for subversive clandestine bacchanalia, which was brought on by the economic boom of the 1920s. Webb's band had at least two steady jobs at these segregated Harlem clubs during the late 20s. In mid-1929, Webb's band took over for Duke Ellington as the house band at the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club at Lenox Avenue and 142nd Street was the most famous and iconic segregated venue in Harlem. In 1925, it adopted a similar whites-only policy to its chief competitor, Connie's Inn. Uh, and Connie's Inn was the club that initiated the practice of building Harlem nightclubs to appeal to uh, downtown and overseas visitors who were predominantly white, or exclusively white, I should say. In taking over for Ellington at the Cotton Club, Webb stepped into the same role through which Ellington had launched his own career with colorful, exotic compositions to accompany the club's salacious floor shows. As the Cotton Club is quite well known and its history uh, fairly broadly available, however, I'm going to speak in more depth about a lesser known venue where Webb played the prior year. In January 1928, the Webb Band began a regular engagement at the Rose Dance Land at 209 West 125th Street near 7th Avenue. And, it, and the Rose Dance Land became an important early venue for the Webb Band to build its reputation. The Baltimore Afro-American described the Rose Dance Land as, quote, the wooziest of creep joints. The Rose Dance Land distinguished itself from its competition through its late hours. It was open until 3 a.m., where similar venues closed at 1 a.m., and through its promise of attractive taxi dancers. And these were African-American women 
who charged a per dance fee to dance with the white male patrons of the club. The magazine Variety did a report describing this taxi dancing as, quote, a tariff dance idea of a dozen crawls for a dollar with an army of hostesses on hand to entertain the visiting fleet. The presence of taxi dancing facilitated mixed race social dancing without integrating the venue. Again, the practice of taxi dancing, uh, in this case, maintained the distinction between white consumer and black service worker, even on the dance floor. So long as black women's bodies remained commodities to be rented for entertainment, this risque, ostensibly dangerous and subversive interracial contact posed no actual threat to the venue's segregated dynamic, nor to the broader white supremacist social order that maintained that dynamic. According to the Baltimore Afro-American, Webb's band was featured regularly at the venue. You see um, a newspaper clipping on the screen. And the white clientele considered his band a gem within an otherwise underwhelming establishment. Though the venue received little press coverage, it is likely that Webb's band was a mainstay uh, throughout the late 1920s. In addition to the aforementioned 1928 account, a 1929 article by Maurice Dancer for the Pittsburgh Courier, another black newspaper, refers to Webb's Harlem Stompers as, quote, regular favorites at Rose Dance Land. Variety described this 11-piece iteration of Webb's group as, quote, the best colored dance band in New York, effectively a single bright spot within an otherwise, quote, common dance hall. Variety's critic praised Webb's band for playing, quote, the colored man's jazz as is, and it's spelled jazz with two Zs, as with a Z, is with a Z. Uh, and the reporter continues on, it's the Caucasian element that knows jazz as is that has converted an impossible loft into a shrewd moneymaker. So in this language, we see this idea of hip white intellectuals in the 1920s effectively dubbing themselves the arbiters of what real black music was and taking credit for its financial success. Um, so I'm gonna go off script for a moment and just note that you know, for myself and for my fellow white people who are watching this presentation, I think it's important food for thought for all of us to consider that when we dub ourselves the arbiters of, of authenticity in art forms that come from African-American culture um, and art forms that are still black art forms, that we're really reproducing um, and our words carry a legacy um, that has done a, a fairly tremendous amount of harm for a very long time. So it's just something that I want all of us to, to marinate on and think about. We can talk about it more in the Q&A if you'd like. However, the situation with these segregated nightclubs does not tell the whole story because during the 1920s, African Americans also found ways to bypass segregated cultural spaces by constructing their own institutions and it was out of this independent striving that the Savoy Ballroom was opened in 1926. Now I'll note that the Savoy Ballroom's owner, Mo Gale, um, was a white man. Um, its chief manager, Charles Buchanan, was African American. So um, a lot of the ballroom's ethos, a lot of its goals, its marketing, its strategies were controlled and guided by Charles Buchanan who worked in this partnership with Mo Gale. The Savoy was to serve as a kind of uptown version of the segregated downtown venue, the Roseland Ballroom, and it contested its counterpart's policies by offering a vision of utopian integration, where people of all races and circumstances were welcomed. Early announcements in the New York Amsterdam News, another African-American newspaper, before the Savoy's March 1926 opening, emphasized that the architects behind segregated downtown dance palaces like the Roseland and Arcadia Ballrooms were overseeing the new Savoy Ballroom's construction and, and described the decoration um, saying that, quote, thousands of dollars have been expended in the interior decorations. Despite such expenditures, the Savoy would charge the relatively low admittance fee of 50 cents. The Savoy also gave black bands a space to play for integrated audiences, though the majority of these audiences were, um, were black. In its advertising, the Savoy emphasized that it would offer black patrons comparable entertainment to what white dance palaces downtown and Harlem nightclubs um, were offering and to which African-American audiences did not have access. Uh, and I quote, thousands have found enjoyment at the Savoy since it has opened. 
and to the credit of the management, be it said that they have always tried to please and hold their large patronage by offering things not to be found at any other place of its kind in the city catering to Negroes. The New York Amsterdam News hoped that the ballroom would, quote, fill a long felt want and supply that something lacking elsewhere. I'm gonna pause for a moment just to let anyone know that um, I, in my own speech, stick to the, ser the terms um, African American or black when describing the people to whom those terms refer. Um, anytime in this presentation you see me using a term like Negro or colored, um, I am doing so within a quotation from a source uh, from the time period. In this case, that source is the New York Amsterdam News. Um, the word Negroes appears um, with a capital N and it was actually considered um, within African American communities to be an honorific term at the time. So some of those historical anachronisms with language can be a little um, difficult to, to navigate. So I wanna make clear about the presentational choices I'm making here. The Amsterdam News's support for the new venue and their concern that it might be discontinued were well-founded and uh, evoked the specter of the segregated Connie's Inn, the venue, of course, that inspired the Cotton Club. Connie's Inn is remembered today as Harlem's first major whites-only cabaret, but it actually opened in 1923 as an integrated venue, three years before the Savoy Ballroom. It's advertisements in black newspapers emphasizing in capital letters that all are welcome. However, these ads disappeared only four months after Connie's Inn opened, and its management ultimately found that segregation increased its appeal to wealthier downtown whites who could outspend Harlem's black residents and thus proved better for the club's financial bottom line. Despite scant press coverage to that point, music columnist Eva Jesse reported in July that Webb's Harlem Stompers at the Savoy were, quote, the hottest eight-piece band in the country. Webb and his Harlem Stompers played the Savoy regularly during most of 1927 and returned in July 1928 after an eight-month absence, presumably while the band was in residence at the Rose Dance Land. So you can see that they were navigating these two presentational worlds simultaneously. In contrast to the primitivist discourse surrounding the so-called jungle music at the Cotton Club at a long jungle alley, the Savoy praised its dance bands as disciplined and orderly, offering audiences a chance to, quote, trip the light fantastic to the melodious strains emanating from a highly trained orchestra. The Savoy also boasted of its employee compensation, claiming that it paid each married male employee no less than $40 per week, and that musicians averaged $75 per week, which I looked it up and that is close to $600 and $1,100, respectively, uh, in today's dollars. And it was roughly three times the average salary for men in Harlem at that time. So not too bad a deal. So as Webb and his contemporaries were making a good living at the Savoy and at a range of other Harlem venues, the landscape around them shifted in late 1929 very abruptly when a wave of stock speculation finally crested, bursting a bubble of Roaring Twenties optimism and sparking the Great Depression, the most severe financial crisis of the 20th century. The onset of the Great Depression hit communities throughout the United States hard, but it hit Harlem and other black neighborhoods even harder. Compared with 10% unemployment nationwide and roughly 17% in New York City, Harlem's unemployment lingered around 25% in 1930 and doubled to an astounding 50%, I'll say that again, 50% by 1933. Those residents lucky enough to find work generally found positions well below their levels of experience or education and were only earning only 50 to 80% of white salaries for similar positions, and they were working significantly longer work weeks. Frustration and desperation made Harlem a much more dangerous place to live, as its already high murder rate more than tripled. Harlem was still better off than many Black communities nationwide, Yet this further compounded the neighborhood's overpopulation problem as still more desperate migrants flooded the area. The increasing demand for housing caused a further spike in rental prices for what were still substandard dwellings. For all the damage the depression wrought on Harlem's African-American population, it did force the entertainment industry 
to refocus their efforts on black audiences. The economic impact on middle and upper class whites um, of the Great Depression prompted a change in social behavior as former Harlem slummers saw their budgets for leisure spending evaporate. Since African Americans in Harlem suffered economically to a more significant extent, extent than did the rest of the city, one would assume their patronage of lavish night spots like the Savoy, the Lafayette Theater, etc., would similarly see a drop off. However, the reverse actually seems to have been true as the venues that survived in the early 1930s in Harlem actually bolstered the role of black patronage in their business models. So why was this the case? I'll suggest two explanations for this phenomenon. First, while Harlem's black population suffered disproportionate impacts economically, the shift in their circumstances, um, I would argue, was one of degree rather than one of kind, of degree rather than of kind. What do I mean by that? Again, as Cheryl Greenberg articulates, Harlem, like most black communities, experienced a depression before the depression. Essentially, nightlife and entertainment targeting black audiences had already thrived in an atmosphere of high unemployment and low wages throughout the 1920s. While the 1929 crash um, radically altered um, the life circumstances, outlooks, and spending patterns, of those who had prospered during the, the so-called Roaring Twenties, again, um, disproportionately white people. There, as Frankie Manning put it, the Depression years, quote, didn't make that much difference to my family since we were poor anyway. Or as the housekeeper of sociologist E. Frank Franklin Frazier reportedly said, quote, I don't know nothing about no depression. I ain't seen nothing but hard times all my life. So the Savoy Ballroom thus continued drawing robust crowds for, as Manning elaborates, quote, dancing was an outlet for people because there wasn't much else they could do. We all stayed in Harlem, but you could find some place to step out every night of the week. Going to a ballroom became our social life. While the Depression may have killed the trend of exotic slumming for wealthy whites, for them Harlem nightlife was a subversive luxury good. For Black Harlem residents, ballrooms and entertainment venues were a necessity, a vital element of public culture and community life. Ballrooms like the Savoy became increasingly important as community need increased during the Depression. In response to government indifference, African Americans in Harlem continued the practice of creating the public and social infrastructure denied to them by a city government relatively unconcerned with Harlem's significant needs. Social services were routed through churches and fraternities, which provided aid to residents. In response to the Great Depression, Harlem's many social clubs took on an even more active role in sponsoring dances and other events in the 1930s, and Webb's band performed much more frequently at dances sponsored by these different types of Harlem social clubs. So we can see the importance of this phenomenon and uh, the Webb Band's crucial role in it by taking a close look at the Alhambra Ballroom, where Webb and his orchestra were in residence for the bulk of the year 1930. The Alhambra's central focus at the time was to host dances sponsored by these many clubs that were so central to Harlem's social culture. The Alhambra was owned by the Keith Alby vaudeville monopoly, and it was originally called the Million Dollar Ballroom until it was renamed and reopened in 1928 after a significant refurbishing and rebranding to model itself after the Savoy when that ballroom had seen such early success. It functioned largely as a venue for society functions and basketball games, though it closed its doors within a year. In July 1929, however, and this is just before the Wall Street crash later that year, the Savoy Ballroom's management leased the Alhambra from Keith Alby and reopened it as a venue that exclusively courted business from social clubs. The Savoy's management took out weekly ads claiming the Alhambra, quote, is destined to be the pronounced favorite of the smartest and most exclusive clubs and fraternal organizations. When they came on board in January 1930, Webb's band was included as part of a rental package for society parties and social functions. Groups often held these functions annually, and some with much greater frequency as a core piece of their contribution to social life in Harlem. 
While some of these events were simply formal or informal dances, others took the form of gala spectacles complete with floor shows and elaborate decorations. For example, one of Webb's earliest gigs at the Alhambra was a dance given by the Debutante Club, described as, quote, one of New York's exclusive younger girls clubs, at which the invited guests wore formal evening gowns and members performed classical ballet at intermission. Featuring Webb at their formal dance and sip event, the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity covered the ballroom in streamers representing their club colors, and quote, an avalanche of balloons, Sigma colors also, and autographed by the frat, rained down on the dancers. The all-male Alwyn's Club, for their spring dance, brought in E. Ronald Eason, a decorator from Chicago, to elaborately transform the Alhambra Ballroom. Per the New York Amsterdam News, quote, the entire scheme of decoration was that of a beautiful English garden and was built around a beautiful fountain topped by a marble fawn. A profusion of palms and shrubbery with garden seats here and there, together with the aid of soft shimmering lights, made the illusion complete. In addition to Webb's music, this affair included an interpretive dancer and a performance by students from the Ann Johnson Dancing School. The Alhambra provided a strong venue for these sorts of affairs as its infrastructure, which the Savoy reportedly spent $50,000 renovating, lent itself to both social dancing and the performance of these high society galas. It was decorated in gold and Nile green and had palm trees lining the entrance to the dance floor. For most of these dances, one could purchase admission for a dollar, but one could also pay $5 for one of the reserve boxes that ran in a ring around the dance floor from the ballroom's mezzanine level. Along with an evening of social dancing, the affairs often included a group sing-along of the club's anthem and a grand march or waltz reserved for the club's members to parade with their escorts before hundreds or thousands of their guests. Clubs thus leveraged the aristocratic associations of European ballroom dancing to craft public spectacles wholly different from the floor shows of Jungle Alley nightclubs. The Alhambra's management, again the same team that ran the Savoy, facilitated the venue's transition into a space for social club culture to flourish by offering a safe and attractive financial incentive to social clubs for whom it was increasingly important um, during the Depression to minimize expenditures given the challenging financial climate. Under the management of Charles Buchanan's protege, Harold Parker, the Alhambra ran advertisements in the New York Amsterdam News throughout 1930, again offering Webb's band as part of a money-saving package for social clubs who could use these events as profitable fundraisers, either for their own sustaining funds or for charitable causes. As it was under the same management, the Alhambra's arrangements with clubs were very likely modeled on the Savoy's innovative financial guarantee. The Savoy had appealed to, so to society clubs essentially since the day it opened um, by guaranteeing financial returns and protecting club members from financial risk. A 1926 bulletin spelled out the Savoy's new program, and here I'll quote at length. Clubs find it unnecessary due to our unique profit sharing plan to worry about what music to engage or the various other complications required to prepare an evening's entertainment for a large crowd. We have systematized the entire procedure so that members of your organization can concentrate their entire time and attention on whatever means are employed to draw a large attendance for the dance. Above all, no one is compelled to obligate themselves with guarantees. You have that feeling of relief, knowing that you have no bills to meet for music, rentals, advertising, etc. And here it is in all caps. In fact, all you have to do is tell your friends you are conducting a dance at the Savoy, urge them to come, and when the dance is over, come into our business office and collect your share of the receipts. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal. With the onset of the Depression, the Savoy and the Alhambra's ability to absorb financial risk made these arrangements all the more popular with and attractive to society clubs. After he left the Alhambra, Webb began a consistent residence at the Savoy that would define his career throughout the mid and late 1930s, when his became the Savoy's most famous house band. Throughout his time at the Savoy, 
Webb performed hot music for social dancing and for Lindy Hop competitions, the stuff we're more familiar with. But the band also continued performing for the types of society functions for which he had performed at the Alhambra. A 1933 report in the New York Amsterdam News indicates the Savoy diversified its offerings by adding hot floor shows like the Lafayette Theater and by continuing and even extending its business with Harlem social clubs. Quote, fighting against the wave of depression that has carried other places of its kind under, the Savoy has instituted an elastic policy, which will permit clubs, especially the long established organizations, to secure the place without the least chance of losing in the arrangements of their affairs. So that certainly sounds like exactly the same financial arrangement they were doing in the 1920s, which they had spelled out when the venue opened. In 1935, the web band played alongside Fess Williams' orchestra, also a longtime Savoy mainstay, for the formal spring dances of the Brooklyn Phi Beta Sigma chapter and the Happy Hour Social Club. The following year, the group played for a spike of spring club events. The Pollyanna Club insisted on a strict black and white dress code for their invite-only affair, and the Savoy's bouncers both scrutinized invitations and turned away anyone otherwise attired. These parties included the, quote, syncopated dance music, Webb's band enshrined on record, but also a wider variety of music for two steps and waltzes. Indeed, most club dances included at least one featured waltz exclusively for the club members and their dates. Both Frankie Manning and Norma Miller have talked in the past about um, the Chick Webb Orchestra being perfectly capable of playing waltzes and that they would play one to end the night. So I just thought I'd note that the, um, the media coverage of the band throughout the 1930s kind of confirms that flexibility as well, even if it was not um, on, on the recordings that survived to this day. So this history also, again, helps explain the band's musical range and flexibility. Webb is most often remembered and celebrated for his hard driving swing arrangements, owing, of course, to the band's catalog of recordings and its reputation as the hottest band in the land from its famous battles against the Goodman and Basie orchestras in the late 1930s. However, black newspapers indicate that Webb's band, especially in the early 30s, also had a strong reputation for playing sweet music, the softer sentimental popular arrangements that were far more broadly commercially popular than hot swing music was at the time. During a visit to the Savoy in 1930, the Baltimore Afro-American reporter George Tyler noted that while Andy Kirk's band supplied the quote dizzying hot music for Lindy Hoppers, Webb's band offered a much softer vibe. And I quote, soft lights overhead on the sidelines of the walls and at our feet behind the orchestra floats, gray clouds, the moon is in evidence. There is the soft tantalizing waltz strains by Chick Webb and his chicks to add a breath of romance to the evening. A different Savoy than we're used to hearing about, but one that Frankie and his peers certainly experienced, remembered, and did talk about. While some clubs used gala events to raise funds for their own club functions, others used them to advance agendas of economic empowerment, social uplift, and charitable giving. In 1930, Webb played for an Alhambra function sponsored by the students at Harlem's Lincoln Secretarial School. The dance was a platform for the trade school's white president, Gilby Robinson, to announce plans to open a department store, quote, as a means of combating the discrimination of race as it is practiced by the leading white concerns. The Webb Band's involvement in charitable work was especially pronounced during the Christmas season. Webb returned to the Lafayette Theater for a midnight benefit show sponsored by the local Elks Lodge, Imperial Lodge number 127, alongside the cast of the review from Small's Paradise to bolster, quote, the Imperial Lodge's efforts to obtain funds for feeding as many as apply on Christmas Day at the home. Webb also joined an interracial fundraiser at the Roseland Ballroom, where his was one of 22 bands, among them Fletcher Henderson's and Duke Ellington's, that joined MC Rudy Valley for a Christmas relief benefit. Webb's involvement in both charitable and political fundraisers continued throughout the early and mid 1930s. In early 1932, jumping back a bit, the Emergency Unemployment Relief Fund Committee's Harlem Division staged a quote, jobless benefit at the Lafayette, 
which featured a plethora of bands and dance acts, including Don Redman and Cab Calloway's bands and the eccentric dancer Earl Snake Hips Tucker. The Lennox Club, Small's Paradise, Connie's Inn, and Cotton Club all lent their current bands and variety show casts to contribute. In 1934, Webb played for the Black members of the Not Hotel Employees Benevolent Association and also joined Al Jolson, Bill Robinson, Ethel Waters, and Willie Bryant's orchestra at the Apollo Theater for a summer benefit for the Harlem Children's Fresh Air Fund, through which the Mahapak Democratic Club sought to, quote, send many of the Harlem youngsters to camp during the hot weather. In 1935, Webb's band furnished the music for a Savoy Ballroom fundraiser for the defendants of the Scottsboro trial. And, um, and this was sponsored by the National Committee for the Defense of Political Prisoners. Also at the Savoy, they joined Duke Ellington and Claude Hopkins's orchestras, along with dance acts including Buck and Bubbles and the Mills Brothers, to help the Frederick Douglass chapter of the John Brown Memorial Association raise funds to erect a statue in Harlem of John Brown, the famous 19th century advocate for the abolition of slavery. Local churches were also asked to hold special sermons and direct practitioners to the event. This type of charitable engagement became a pattern for Webb, who in 1936 donated personal funds to flood relief and offered to pay for any function nationwide benefiting victims of widespread flooding. Webb's enthusiasm for charity work and benefit gigs extended his reach and visibility with white audiences, including the upper reaches of New York society. He appeared on stage at the Metropolitan Opera House in April 1935 as a surprise act for the Met's annual fundraiser benefiting its maintenance fund. Webb's participation received significant coverage in the black press for, as the New York Amsterdam News put it, the fact that Chick Webb of Harlem stepped out in such famous company made this section of the community raise its eyebrows. With this event, Webb's group became the first African-American band to ever perform at the Metropolitan Opera House. Shortly following his appearance at the Met, Webb's band was tapped by the Musicians Union for a citywide benefit where orchestras toured throughout ballrooms all over New York City. The one-night circuit included other prominent Black bands such as Claude Hopkins and Don Redmond's bands, but it also included the, the most prominent white orchestras at the time, Paul Whiteman's and Guy Lombardo's bands. So finally, I'd like to revisit the Rose Dance Land, the segregated jungle alley taxi dancing club I discussed earlier in this talk to show what a difference just a few years can make. And because its strange history is very broadly instructive regarding some of the most important social and economic forces at play for Harlem's ballroom scene during this time period. So in March of 1933, Webb left the Savoy management's umbrella to take up residence at the new Dixie Ballroom. The Dixie was a grand reimagining, effectively a rebranding of the segregated Rose Dance Land, that creep joint, where Webb and his band played regularly in 1928. It was now redesigned as an upscale integrated ballroom to rival the Savoy. Now this Dixie residency is really no more than a minor blip on the radar of Webb's storied career. Within a month, Webb's band had left the Dixie after management repeatedly failed to compensate them. By May, Webb's band was back at the Savoy playing opposite Fess Williams, so it lasted less than two months. By any reasonable measure, the Dixie Ballroom was a complete flop, yet the circumstances and rhetoric surrounding its brief life reveal crucial shifts in the social, economic, and racial dynamics of Harlem nightlife that had far-reaching impacts throughout the 1930s on Webb's career and on Harlem's cultural and political life more broadly. And you're going to see this underscore some of the points I was making earlier about how we can think about the, the economics and the shifts in um, Harlem's ballroom scene um, as a result of the Depression. Specifically, the Dixie Ballroom offers a window into a moment in time that truly underscores the erosion of white slumming culture and a resultant push for more integration, as well as a crescendo of anger and frustration surrounding the persistent racially driven economic oppression along Harlem's main commercial thoroughfare. Owing to the Savoy's continued success, which it enjoyed for the numerous reasons I've outlined, other venues turned their attention toward young Black clientele. In early 1933, the Rose Dance Land, the creep joint where Webb played in 1928, 
dropped its segregated policies and completely recast itself as an integrated dance palace. Seeking to capitalize on and replicate the Savoy's successful operations, they brought in Harold Parker as ballroom manager, a longtime Savoy assistant who had managed the Savoy for a year in Charles Buchanan's absence, and who again was in charge of their Alhambra ballroom operations. Parker oversaw a complete refurbishing and redecoration of the dance hall in an effort to rival the splash made by the Savoy's opening several years prior. In early press releases about the change, Parker announced that Webb's orchestra would serve as the ballroom's stable house band, as they had come off a successful run in this capacity at the Savoy during 1932, and at the Savoy run Alhambra in 1930, when of course Parker was the manager there, so there's that connection. The Chicago Defender reported that the, quote, news of the new Pleasure Palace has caused great comment from the younger set in Harlem. Up to now, the Savoy has held the attention of the hopping crowd. Now it is expected that the floors of the Dixie will rebound to the leaping of the sheiks and the ladies. Early press announcements routinely referred to the Savoy as the Dixie's model, and Parker's strategy seems to have been to set admission price points even below the Savoy's already low fees. And this advertisement here um, shows an event at the Dixie featuring Teddy Hill and the Chick Webb Orchestra, um, 35 cents per man, 25 cents per woman. The ballroom's opening placed pressure on the Savoy to lower its prices, and the Amsterdam News alluded that they were feeling the pressure, reporting that, quote, the opening of the new place has already brought about competition in Harlem ballrooms, and prices have been lowered at one of the older places. It's fairly clear they're referring to the Savoy. As the Chicago Defender noted, the new dance palace was especially promising given its 125th Street location. As this street was both Harlem's most segregated and symbolically important thoroughfare, the Dixie powerfully represented, quote, the first step taken by Negroes to occupy space on West 125th Street. As the Defender further observed in celebrating the Dixie's opening, quote, more employment is offered, race people and the community rejoice. The ballroom thus marked racial progress against both cultural and economic segregation, as it represented a push into Harlem's central commercial thoroughfare, um, a street whose segregated spaces would drive the frustration between um, a series of rates riots only two years later in 1935. According to 1931 figures, African Americans owned less than 20% of central Harlem businesses. The Pittsburgh Courier emphasized um, the Dixie Ballroom's opening and its potential significance, underscoring that, quote, whites have long resisted the Negroes' invasion of 125th Street. Some years ago, the Alhambra Theater, 126th Street and 7th Avenue, had a policy of segregation, which finally resulted in the house going colored, as we just discussed. Next, it was Lowe's Victoria on 125th Street, just around the corner from the Alhambra. But the depression caused all the theaters in the neighborhood to let down the color bar. And again, that's all from the Pittsburgh Courier. The Dixie Ballroom's opening night was promising. It featured three bands led by Chick Webb, Teddy Hill, and Claude Hopkins, and it included a, a slate of VIP guests from Harlem's entertainment industry, including Kaiser Marshall, Lillian Cowan, and other, quote, stars from Connie's Inn, the Radium Club, and other Harlem hotspots. The opening night crowd reportedly um, numbered over 2,000 and packed the ballroom to its capacity. Maurice Dancer gave an account of the scene for his Harlem by Night column in the Pittsburgh Courier. Quote, Thursday night, one of the largest crowds we've witnessed of late trying to gain entrance to the lately turned from white to colored Dixie Ballroom, smuggled through the rear door, we find Harold Parker, former manager of the Savoy Ballroom, actually turning them away. Packed like sardines on the dance floor, they attempt to shuffle to those Chick Webb and Teddy Hill hot tunes. Noting the array of young patrons dancing the Lindy Hop and the Waltz, the New York Amsterdam News encouragingly projected tremendous success for the new ballroom, offering the following assessment. Quote, most artistically arranged, one of America's finest ballrooms will continue to present as it did on its opening night, entertainment, music, and sizzling programs that will thrill you. 
The Amsterdam News' hopeful prediction, however, never came to fruition. Despite the hopes of replicating or surpassing the Savoy's success on 125th Street, the new ballroom closed after only two months, citing lagging attendance and a resultant inability to pay its musicians. The Dixie switched from a two-band to a single-band format featuring Kaiser Marshall, yet still failed to draw a sufficient audience to sustain its business. Though the Dixie's opening was met with optimistic, racial uplift-driven rhetoric, only two months later, the New York Amsterdam News offered a more cynical view of the motivation behind its rebranding efforts. Quote, Despite the growth of Negro families in the community, the Dixie, as Rose Danceland, continued to cater to whites only until forced by changing conditions to make an appeal for the darker trade. The Dixie installed the Savoy policy, but business never picked up. So while the Dixie failed, its attempt to survive in the new environment helps again bolster this observation I made earlier, that the depression's the erosion of white slummers' leisure budgets had clearly made formerly successful segregated venues in Harlem, as the Rose Dance Land had once been, no longer viable. Harlem venues that did not wish to integrate for ideological reasons were being forced to for economic reasons. Now, although Charles Buchanan of the Savoy claimed the Dixie's run had no impact on them, they did adjust their already low prices further downwards, an advertisement that ran on the same newspaper page as the aforementioned article about the Dixie's closure advertised the new Savoy's reduced entry fees for Saturday evenings at 65 cents for men and 35 cents um, for women and Sunday matinees at 50 cents. While the Dixie Ballroom was clearly a failed effort that never had a significant impact on the Harlem ballroom scene, the logic and strategies behind its creation, as well as the newspaper rhetoric surrounding its brief run and its impact on the Savoy, yield important information about the ballroom landscape in Harlem and the depression's impact upon it. Emphasis on the Dixie's efforts to ape the Savoy's upscale decor and integrated format bolster the evidence that the Savoy was uniquely able to sustain its business amid the shifting economic landscape. The Dixie's attempts, however, to challenge the Savoy validate the exceptional nature of the Savoy's business model but also suggest that other ballrooms failed to generate significant demand to expand it. This makes it all the more important for Webb's relative success during the 1930s that he maintained a positive relationship with the Savoy Ballroom's management and a steady gig there as the leader of the house band. So it seems fortunate for him that he was able to immediately go back to the Savoy after um, the Dixie's management seemed to have been able to poach him and Harold Parker for their failed efforts. One final point I'd like to underscore is Webb's active involvement with several organizations um, supporting African-American musicians. His prolific appearances in stage and nightclub reviews, for example, were likely linked to his membership in the Rhythm Club, an organization that aided black band leaders in, uh, in finding work. Founded in 1927 by Chicago musician Burt Hall on 132nd Street, the Rhythm Club functioned as a nightclub and musicians hang out, but more importantly, as a collective self-help organization for Black musicians. Hall's club was part of a wave of similar organizations that sought to combat structural discrimination through mutual aid and organized collective advocacy. For example, in 1930, Harlem Grocers founded the Colored Merchants Association to negotiate collectively with wholesalers and otherwise improve their business models through cooperative initiatives. The Harlem Businessmen's Club formed due to segregated policies that excluded Black business owners from the Harlem Board of Commerce. Hall also had a strong model for this type of organization for musicians, specifically within Harlem's musical history, as James Reese Europe's Clef Club had similarly organized Black musicians two decades prior and had expanded their placement at theaters and ballrooms through the organization's collective reputation for professionalism and excellence. By 1933, the Rhythm Club had over 1,500 members and boasted on its roles, quote, the names of most of the leading Negro artists in America. In addition to its president, Teddy Hill, who would later famously manage Minton's Playhouse, the Rhythm Club counted among its members Webb, Fletcher Henderson, Fess Williams, and Claude Hopkins, all of whom were featured regularly in both ballrooms and large stage reviews. 
Before his death in 1933, Bert Hall had used his successful efforts with the Rhythm Club to expand Black participation in the Musicians Union Local 802, for whom Webb did fundraising and benefit work, as I discussed earlier. Webb also became represented by Associated Colored Orchestra's management, who helped him secure bookings both locally and nationally. Most major Black bands in New York aligned themselves with the ACO, including Fletcher Henderson, Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Fess Williams, Vernon Andrade, and Mills Blue Rhythm Boys. The ACO also succeeded at increasing Black bands' access to the radio airwaves, and Webb took particularly strong advantage of this opportunity. By 1931, ACO bands were featured regularly on two radio stations, WMCA and WPCH. These stations were owned by Donald Flam, the press agent and publisher behind the Theater Guild magazine that promoted Broadway entertainment. He was a strong proponent of featuring Black entertainers on his stations. Their vision fit the demands of radio as a medium, which sought both to fill massive amounts of airtime with programming and to diversify that programming to reach as many demographics as, of listeners as possible. As the Pittsburgh Courier explained the medium's potential, quote, in view of the fact that radio has universalized its programs with a view to catering to every group and variety <clears throat> of its gigantic audience, the Negro has played his rightful part in every parody or significant designation. While other orchestras made only periodic radio appearances, Webb proved to have significant staying power on the airwaves. The same month as the aforementioned piece ran in the Courier, the Chicago Defender reported, quote, that Webb is the only leader whose band can be heard over the radio nightly. Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Blue Rhythm, and the rest have all ceased playing over the air, but Webb remains. Webb's band, in fact, became omnipresent on the radio during the early 1930s, ultimately receiving a sustaining program three times weekly on WNBC, and he was one of the first, if not the first, African-American band leaders to do so. By moving his band into the realms of institutional advocacy and benevolent fundraising, Webb participated actively in the growing culture of local institution building through which Harlemites responded to the declining economy and to relative indifference from the official engines of public relief. Ultimately, I think there are a number of important lessons to learn here for working artists and really for everyone um, during this terrible pandemic we're all facing. Um, regarding resilience, flexibility, seeing the possibilities of new media technologies in Webb's case radio. But I think most importantly, uh, the value of serving and working within one's community and through community-based structures of mutual support as a meaningful pathway to multiple kinds of success. And in addition to being a virtuoso drummer, I think this kind of community engagement with his local fan base in Harlem is central to Webb's success and really the thing I've always found most fascinating about him and about this band. So normally I would put a bow on this sort of talk with some profoundly worded conclusion, but under these circumstances and in the spirit of this idea of centering community, um, I'm hoping that we can use the Q&A period um, to build that conclusion together. I wanna hear from you all about what you're doing in your communities uh, and where and how this talk it's home for you. Um, how does Chick Webb's work and the community of Harlem as a whole, thriving during a period of tremendous crisis, um, move you to expand in new directions, try new things, organize and offer new kinds of support to your own friends and neighbors? Um, so um, let's go ahead and talk about that. I am going to try and stop my screen share here. You know, actually, before I stop my screen share, I did want to actually point out one really important option for how you can participate in and feel inspired by these kinds of mutual support networks that African Americans in Harlem built in response to the Great Depression, and that is through the wonderful organization that is sponsoring this talk, the Frankie Manning Foundation. So if you go to the Frankie Manning Foundation's website, here is, of course, a wonderful advertisement for my talk. Um, we have the Shim Sham Relay, which was really wonderful. Um, and then if you click on this link for the emergency fundraising update, you will go to this emergency fundraising update. 
if you click on this link here or if you type in frankiemanningfoundation.org slash emergency, it will take you to this wonderful fundraiser for the Frankie Manning Foundation Emergency Support Program, which you can see on this GoFundMe has raised um, um, almost $16,000 of its $20,000 goal. So there's still more work to be done. And you know, many dancers around the world um, and, and um, dance scene organizers, um, people who have kind of taken the, the leap of doing this work full time of dedicating their entire lives and building their livelihoods on um, preserving the memory of Frankie Manning, um, the Lindy Hop, the, the dance and music culture, which he so loved and which he did so much for. Um, a lot of those people have seen um, their, their businesses, their livelihoods, uh, partially or completely wiped out, you know, we hope temporarily um, by, by this terrible pandemic as people can't go out to social dances or take dance classes and things like that. And there's some work being done through online dance classes. It's wonderful to attend those. Um, but, you know, unfortunately for, for now, they're not completely filling that gap and, and meeting that need. So the foundation um, is doing its part to step in with this emergency support program. Um, so one way that you can help get, um, dedicate your own resources and participate is to donate to this wonderful effort. Um, and that money is being used to help support dancers all around the world who help fulfill the foundation's mission of preserving the Lindy Hop, um, preserving the memory of Frankie Manning, um, the cultural context surrounding the Lindy Hop, et cetera. Um, it's been really inspiring to get involved with and, and work with the foundation and the great things that they do. And um, I hope that if nothing else, this talk perhaps motivates you all to get more motivated with the foundation as well and to brainstorm initiatives and efforts you can undertake in your own community. Um, I wanted to quickly give um, some, some credit also to uh, Stephanie Kreese, who is writing a biography of Chick Webb right now. And just, uh, we, we had a really lovely conversation, talked through some of these issues, and um, I'm really looking forward to reading her book. Um, so look for it um, when it comes out. I don't wanna say exactly when, because I don't wanna put her under um, too much pressure, but that's gonna be it for me for now. Um, I went ahead and recorded this talk ahead of time to mitigate any potential technology issues. So I am going to sign off for now, and you will probably see me in a second, probably in a different outfit because we're gonna do a and a live. So thank you very much for tuning in. And again, thank you to the Frankie Manning Foundation for sponsoring this talk.